If we think about some of our family or friends or colleagues, we can definitely identify the selfish and we can definitely identify the altruistic. So how do we split the difference and what might be going on there in terms of our decision making? Yeah, well, what I think is I think that we all have capacities of each within us and that there are certain frameworks that are going to help us to to bring out one versus the other. There's a, a psychologist, uh, Jonathan Haidt, you may have heard of him. He, he's, he writes a lot. He's, he's got a wonderful metaphor that I think is really um, instructive to this. So he, he has this metaphor that he calls of the, the rider and the elephant. Okay. And that's how he describes human nature that, you know, we, we do have control, uh, but we're kind of like our, the deliberate part of our, our decision-making process is like this person who's riding an elephant. And as long as the elephant doesn't, you know, have a, a desire of, of his own, we can tell the elephant which way to go. But if the elephant really wants to do something, we're kind of powerless to, to pull it back and rein it in the other way. So I, I think this is a really good metaphor for human nature because there are certain contexts in which that altruism is more likely to flourish and in other contexts in which, you know, jealousy or, or selfishness or, or something else tends to, tends to predominate. And so identifying those contexts, uh, I think, is a, a really important kind of social goal and, and goal of, of social science. So free will is a, a hotly debated topic, but, I, you know, at the same time, it's kind of, um, it's kind of at the root of, of what we see as, as human beings. You know, intrinsically, the way we view each other, we see each other as, as free and autonomous beings. And there's something about it that is just seems to be fundamental. A lot of philosophers and scientists have wrestled with this issue for a long time. Uh, there was a, a scientist, fairly well-known scientist, Robert Sapolsky, who came out with a book in the fall of 2023, basically saying that, yeah, you know, free will is just an illusion, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I, you know, I, I take this head on and I think there's good data to suggest that, that he is not quite right. Um, I agree with him that there are lots of things that factor into the decisions that we make, but that doesn't mean that things are 100% determined beforehand, that this conversation that we're having right now is, is not inevitable. Uh, and it, it was not somehow pre-written or pre-ordained into the, the Big Bang. Um, so, uh, happy to dig into kind of what, what evidence suggests that. The religious aspect of free will is certainly not determined either. Even within, uh, Christianity, there are those sects that believe that you're just going to live out God's plan. And then there are those in, uh, in certain sects of Christianity that are like, no, you do have free choice and free will and, uh, your actions are going to determine uh, your result. So even in the religious aspect, it, it's certainly not. Correct, correct. And, and I think what you're referring to probably dates back to John Calvin and this notion that, you know, whatever happens is God will. And, and how can God be all powerful if if we also have free choice and and that sort of thing? So I, I you know, th this book, as, you, as you've noted, there, there's a there's a deep kind of religious implication to it. I mostly kind of shy away from delving into theology, but just like, you know, trying to appeal to the, the sense that most, most people have that life has value and meaning and so forth. And that there, you know, that there is some sort of higher, higher purpose or higher power. What the science says, or my interpretation of the science are, are, are two things. And, and when you talk about free will, inevitably you have to come up to, a kind of boring but necessary task of defining your terms. Uh, because when we talk about free will, some people mean one thing, some people mean another thing. Uh, for me, at least, it's, it's kind of built into the term itself that the free part, that there are some actions that are not deterministically tied to the past. And there's some, some wiggle room in the cause and effect relationship that is so important to, you know, how we often view the world. Um, the other part is that the will part is that we can we can with our thoughts control our our behaviors and our actions. And I think there's 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 good good scientific evidence that that both of those propositions hold that behavior even at even in relatively simple organisms. Um, for instance, in, in one experiment, biologists have a a leech 
and they and and the leech can respond in one of two different ways to a stimulus. It can either swim or it can crawl. And they'll, you know, they'll set up the experiment to where the conditions are exactly the same, but they can't predict is the leech going to swim or crawl. They'll do it, you know, it's kind of a probabilistic thing. And they'll say, well, you know, 60% of the time it'll do one thing, 40% it'll do another. They'll do experiments with other organisms like a worm or a cockroach, something like that. And there seems to be this unpredictability about it that no matter what, if you if you control the, the conditions exactly the same way, uh, even with the same organism, it will behave in different ways. And so, um, you know, as you get to humans, it becomes more and more complex. But my logic is that, look, if, if these simple organisms behave in ways that are, are fundamentally indeterministic, do we really think that humans are going to be fully deterministic? And I think that's kind of a, a relatively... Uh, you know, straightforward conclusion that, that, that we're not deterministic. 